Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Vernon. We're glad you're worshiping with us this beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. I, it sounds like you're already doing it, but uh, take a moment now, turn around, greet one another, celebrate the joy of Jesus Christ this morning. Where's your hubby? Several announcements to bring to your attention. First, um, thank you for my time away. Last week I was at a continuing education conference down in Georgia, heard two magnificent speakers. You'll be hearing a lot about some of the stuff I learned over the next coming weeks, but I, I value my continuing education time, and so I appreciate um, your, that gift, that great gift that you give to me. Friday, I had some knee surgery done, so if you see me limping around, that's what happened. Um, I'm on the mend, though, so keep me in your thoughts and prayers over the next couple of weeks. Several announcements. First, a reminder that next Saturday starts our Stay Treat with David Lamott becoming a world changer. That's going to be the focus all weekend, so I hope you're planning to be here. You can sign up in the Fellowship Hall or where the coffee is, and you can, sell, you can sign up in the narthex on your way out this morning on the bulletin board to the left. Um, we have added a sign up for the potluck brunch, which is going to take place after worship next Sunday. Um, so if you're going to be here for all or part of it, we would love to know that. I pr again, I promise you, you will, you will be inspired and you will be motivated. David is a wonderful speaker and a great musician, so join us next week. The youth are planning, again, I think they've done this before, um, a Valentine's Day dinner, so I've been asked to remind you about that. Valentine's Day is Saturday this year, so get your honey, come on out for um, dinner. We, this year, the entertainment is going to be a nationally known storyteller um, who's going to be there to tell funny stories, thought-provoking stories. His name is Anthony Bircher. Um, that will take place following dinner again at the Youth Valentine dinner on February 14th. And last, my wife has asked me to let you know that there are still 10 open spots on the flower chart. Um, she's kind of coordinating that, so if you have not signed up and would like to, please feel free to fill in those spots. Is that everything? Anything else that I need to lift up today? Any other announcements for anyone? All right. The Lord, Habakkuk says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Come, let us worship God.
Please be seated. As we continue our worship this morning, let's take a moment to go to God in prayer. Father, we come worshiping you today, grateful for your many blessings, assured by your love, and filled with the desire to serve you more. We also come today acknowledging our sins, the brokenness that can make us feel separated from you. But you have taught us, Lord, that it is through our brokenness that you instruct us. We have come to learn that it takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give the crops rain, broken grain to provide bread, and it is through the broken bread that we receive our strength. So this morning, open our ears to your words of instruction and our hearts to your grace that we may leave today better prepared to serve as missionaries of your word. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, Psalm 131. Listen now for God's word for us today. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
While the choir is returning to their seats with the boys and girls, come on down front for the children's sermon, please. So who's got our children's sermon bag today? Do you have it, Carson? Do you have it? You want to bring it up? Come on, bring it over here so I, we can see. Hey, you guys, everybody come on down here on the front part, okay? Jack? Or who is that? Ian, come on down front. All right, let's see what's in, let's see what's in the bag today. It feels like it has wheels. Does it have wheels? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's see what it is. This is going to require an explanation, I think. Okay, is this a transformer? Yeah. It is a transformer. Okay, so, so like this, this looks like when it's a truck, right? Now, what does it become? What does it transform into? A truck. Can, a robot. Well, can it transform back? Can you do that for me? Show us what it transforms back into. Oh, what's, it, what's his name? Optimus Prime. This is Optimus Prime. I should know that. I know. Do you guys all know this guy? Yeah. No? So what does a transformer do? It transforms. Right. Yeah. What does it mean to transform? Carson, do you know what it means to transform? No? No? You change, right? Something like Optim Optimus Prime transforms into a truck, right? So, did you know that our faith is about transformation? Our faith is all about transformation, too. What do we, Ian, you look like you're thinking there, what do we transform into? Bananas? Bananas? <laughs> okay. Maybe that's how we start. When, when, when we talk about transformation in Christianity, in our faith, we talk about how God gives us new life. It's about tra being transformed and being given new life. So when you know Jesus, as you learn about Jesus, it kind of changes us and it transforms us so that we become more and more like him. So we, did you know that... How, did you guys know you're a transformer? No, I'm not. You are. You and everybody out here, we are all transformers. God is working in all of us, and he's transforming us so that we become more and more like him. I'm not a machine. You're not a machine. That's exactly right. But we can still transform. It's not quite like the cartoon or the movie, but we're still changing. And that's what our faith is all about. Okay, let's, let's pray, um, and then you guys can go back to your seats or children in worship, all right? Let's pray. You guys ready? Carson, will you pray with us? Dear God, thank you for transforming us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen. Okay, who has not had the bag yet? Anybody not, anybody not had it? Have you not had it before? Have you had it? Okay, you're going to be here next week? Jamie, and you guys going to be here next week? Yep, okay, you can take it. There you go. Carson, what are you doing?
Please be seated. Try this sitting down here today, which will be hard for this Italian who likes to move, you know, around a little bit. Well, our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. Powerful words that speak to us not just about our own faith, about our own walk with God, but very much part of Buddhism, which is where we are focusing today. So listen for what the Spirit might have to say to you this morning. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. Religion is arguably the most powerful and pervasive force on earth. That's how the Reverend Dr. Charles Kimball begins his book, When Religion Becomes Evil. Kimball is an ordained Baptist pastor, the former chair of the Department of Religion at Wake Forest University, and the current director of religious studies at the University of Oklahoma. He writes this, throughout history, Religious ideas and commitments have inspired individuals and communities of faith to transcend narrow self-interest in pursuit of higher values and truth. The record of history does show that noble acts of love and self-sacrifice and service to others are deeply rooted in religious worldviews. So he acknowledges that. However, at the same time, history also clearly shows that religion has often been linked directly to the worst examples of human behavior. Kimball rightly points out that in spite of all the good that we in the faith community have done over the centuries, more wars have been waged, more people killed, and these days, the days in which we are living today, more evil perpetrated over religious disagreements than just about anything else. And as a result, Kimball's contention is relatively simple. While not in any way interested in restricting people's free exercise of religion, he says discernment is so important for us. And he says this, whatever religious people may say about their love of God 
or the mandate of their religions, when their behavior toward others is violent or destructive, when it causes suffering among their neighbors, you can be sure that that religion has become corrupted. And when that happens, when that happens, lines need to be clearly drawn. If you were here for my first two sermons in this series on Jesus speaking to the religions of the world, then hopefully by now you know that in order for us to learn to live peaceably together, in order for us to learn when we can and cannot draw lines, in order for us to discern what truly is of God and not of God, we need to know a little bit about the religions that are around us. We need to understand what other people think and believe in order for us to know what is true and what is not. So far, we've looked at Judaism and Islam. This morning, we're going to jump into Buddhism. And let me make it clear once again that while there's some pretty important differences, if you are in the adult Sunday school class, then you know this, There are some pretty important and significant differences between all of the world's major faiths. There is a whole lot that we hold in common, and that is what I am choosing to focus on, because that's, I think, the beginning of this process of learning to respect each other. So, Buddhism. What do you already know about Buddhism? Northern and Southern School, two different denominations, maybe you'd say, okay? What else? Okay? Buddha is not God. Buddha is not God. Is there a God in Buddhism? It wasn't very relevant to the Buddha. Buddha does, does not take a stand. It really does not. Buddha, Buddhism is not about a belief in God. Some would say it's not even a religion. Okay, because there's no kind of theism in in Buddhism. What else do you know about Buddhism? Eric? They say that again? They believe in the law of karma. Karma. What is karma? Good good actions lead to good karma. Bad actions lead to bad karma. Okay? There are consequences. For actions. What else? They believe in meditation. Okay. Keely? They believe in reincarnation. Okay. What else? Anything more? Okay. It's based off the first Buddha. That's where it, where it started. Back in the 6th century BCE. Anything else? He was, the Buddha was a human being, right. Who only saw the good things of life and was disappointed that he didn't see the rest of life. Okay, Keely? Okay, they believe that the goal is nirvana. What is nirvana? This, that state of enlightenment, really. Right? Well, great start. Great start. Let me kind of move us into it a little more um, today. Buddha, um, first of all, Buddhism is the religion of roughly three million people around the world. And, And the name, the name of the religion comes to us from the word Buddha, which means to awaken. That's what it what it means. Buddhists have a worldview. with with origins that go back, as as, uh, Dominic has rightly pointed out, probably about 2,500 years. That's when it is believed that the first Buddha lived, Siddhartha Gautama. And and as we heard in our class today, he, at a very young age, was, was encouraged to see all of the good things of life, kind of what Faye was pointing out, and that bored him to tears. Um, He married... Divorced at the age of 29, and at the age of 35, he was enlightened. 
He discovered all that he needed to know about living an enlightened life here. Now, as I already said, many people contend that Buddhism is not a religion because what it is all about ultimately is this way of life. Buddhism is a, is a perspective. It's about the path, an enlightened way of living. It really says very little about any kind of a belief in God. There's no talk about sacraments or religious rituals. That's not important to Buddhism. The accounts of Buddha's life, the first Buddha, um, his life, his discourses, all of the rules are believed by Buddhists to, to have been summarized after the first Buddha's death, and now they are just memorized by his followers. Most sects of Buddhism believe that there have been and there will be many other Buddhas, not just one. In fact, there are some segments of Buddhism that even teach that Jesus was a Buddha. Their teachings, these teachings are central to their faith. And faithfulness is born in one's acceptance of what are referred to, we learned this morning, as the three jewels. They are the Buddha, or the enlightened teacher, the Dharma, or all of the things he taught them, taught, teaches us, and third, the Sangha, or the community of monks. Those are the, the Buddhas or the teachers that would follow. Taking refuge, the, the phrase that I read this week was, the Buddhist takes refuge in these three gems. They don't worship any of them. It's all about following the path. It's all about the way. Now, if you were to summarize the teachings, you could do so with, what a, does anybody know? We heard it this morning. You could summarize them with the four what? The four noble truths. That's how they're referred. The four noble truths. The first is that there is suffering in the world. That's the first noble truth of the Buddha. There is suffering in the world. The second is that this suffering comes about, why? We learned this morning. Because of cravings. Because of cravings that, that kind of lead us in the wrong ways, or they, they focus us on the wrong things. The third noble truth is this can change. Our suffering can change when our cravings change. And the fourth noble truth is all of this change takes place when we embrace the eightfold path. Okay, you with me so far? So before we even look at those, those eight, that eightfold path, or the, yeah, the eightfold path, let me say this. Again, no talk about God so far. In our Sunday school class this morning, no mention of God up until this point. These truths that are being taught by the Buddha are very much, if you stop and think about it, like the Christian understanding of sin, repentance, and transformation. Very appropriate children's sermon today for the message. It's all, it's very similar to a recognition of the sin that exists in the world, the suffering, repentance. It comes about because we have these false cravings and we can change. It's all about change. The Buddha teaches that bringing about these changes comes again with this eightfold path. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it, but it's about developing the right understanding, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. It's all about what's going on inside of us, the way we think, the way we behave, the way we treat other people, Buddhism is about training ourselves inwardly so that outwardly our lives might reflect what we see as the way of Jesus. What, what we say is right and good, kind and faithful. It's where the common ground, I think, between Buddhism and Christianity can be found. 
Because while there really are no major Buddha, Buddhist beliefs about God, about Jesus, they don't talk about original sin or atonement or even salvation the way we do. All their desire is, is to live in an enlightened way, the right way. The path that they seek to follow is no different than the path that you and I would seek to follow. It's why Jesus calls us to his way. And why we know from John that that way is the only way to God. As, I've, as I, I'm sure I've stated several times before here, when you think about John 14, 6, you know that passage? Where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How does it end? No one comes to the Father but by me. When Jesus says that in John's gospel, when he talks about being the way and the truth and the life, I'm not sure that was ever meant to be some kind of exclusive, religiously restrictive claim on the part of Christ. He was simply pointing out that his way was the only way to God, the way of goodness, the way of compassion, the way of love. That's how we come to know God. It's not, it's not as a result of religious ritual or tradition or by adherence to a certain set of religious laws. It's about His way. And we need not be fearful when we discover that that way may also be the way of someone else. Even someone called Buddha. In fact, particularly with regard to Buddhism, I would contend that some of their practices might even be used to deepen our own attempts to be faithful to our convictions. And that's why I think you see more and more people, even within the Christian community, doing yoga today. That's why so many Christ followers are practicing that practice. Shannon and I both grew up in homes where people who didn't know Jesus the way we did were going to be damned to hell for all eternity. That was the environment in which both of us were raised. And we spent a lot of time, even in our adult lives, in that environment. They were going to wind up in hell. This place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. Think about that. All eternity. And at the same time, we were told that this God we worshipped was a God of love. This one responsible for judging all creation was, was a God of love. And we sang about grace that was incredibly amazing. We were taught that non-Christian people could not possibly know God, let alone be loved by God. So when we talk to our family today about doing yoga, they, they really think we have embraced the enemy, let me tell you. It's as though we've begun walking down this dark path toward destruction. Anybody here ever done yoga? If you've done yoga, raise your hand. Whoa, okay. I, I know, Monday morning. Are, are you doing it here? You did? Good, all right. If you, I, the first time Shannon and I ever did yoga, we were actually at a pastor's convention, um, a national pastor's convention. It was held out in San Diego in January, let me tell you, for about 10 years. Wonderful way, place to go for a pastor's conference in January. But that's where we first did yoga, and it was listed on the schedule as Christian yoga. Do you remember this? We went down by the pool, and the first thing the instructor, who happened to be a pastor's wife, the first thing she said to us was, by the way, I need to tell you, there's no such thing as Christian yoga. It was the only way I could get it on the schedule at this conference was to call it Christian yoga. But she said, yoga is yoga. There's no such thing as Christian yoga or Buddhist yoga or Hindu yoga. It just happens to have been started in the East sometime in the 5th or 6th century, again, B.C., by those in the Buddhist tradition. And it's a practice. They talk a lot about it being a practice. It involves the mind and the body and, and the attempt to try to unite the two a little bit. 
It's a form of mental and physical and spiritual exercise. And today, it is practiced around the world by people of all faiths because of what it can do for us spiritually. It's an attempt to slow us down through measured breathing and poses with your body that reflect the attitude that you are to embrace with your mind. Now the, now, the best example I can give you of this is when I'm lying down doing yoga, the instructor, at least a good one, will encourage me to rotate my shoulders under my back and to open my heart. Now, physically, that process is, is good. You open your, your I'm not a doctor, you, you breathe better, you just open yourself up. But think about it spiritually. What does it mean for me spiritually to open my heart to God, to the people that God has placed in my life? As I open my chest, as I clear my airways and relax the muscles in my upper body, so too do I become mindful of Christ's call upon my life to open my heart to everyone that I meet. And so I do this all the time lately. You know, when I'm driving and get frustrated on 95, I can just sit there and kind of open my heart and relax a little bit and realize that the people around me, they're not intentionally trying to annoy me, you know? <laughs> when I'm lying awake at 2 o'clock in the morning and can't get to sleep, I can just lay there and open my heart and just try to relax and think about the people that God has called me to love at this point in my life. The poses have all kinds of names, weird names. Shavasana, Bhattakanasana. And they're, they're names that, that sound foreign to us and so we become fearful of them. It's just a different language. That's all it is. The Four Noble Truths. The Eightfold Path. The disciplines like yoga and meditation. They're all meant to lead us toward nirvana, or we would say toward health, toward wholeness, toward transformation. There's a very deep embracing, as somebody said, of the law of karma, or that, that law of cause and effect, where positive actions lead to positive results and negative actions lead to negative results. It's about learning to embrace good karma, living a good life. I would say it's very much akin to a progressive Christian's understanding of salvation or eternal life. Now, the traditional Buddhist would embrace this idea of reincarnation, people who are reborn again and again so that, so that they might be encouraged to live a better life. We might have a problem with some of that. But not all Buddhists would embrace that literal understanding of rebirth. Just the way many Christians understand rebirth and eternal life differently today. In the end, it's all about unity with the universal soul. And I know that sounds just so foreign to us. But Christians... It is something that we can experience even in a small way, here and now, when we recognize this, this good way of living. The way of the Buddha, the way of Jesus. Let me also mention Zen Buddhism, just because I thought this was interesting, and many of us have heard of that. Zen is one of the oldest schools of Buddhism in Japan. And in addition to traditional Buddhist teaching, it stresses that the potential for enlightenment and achieving nirvana exists in everyone. It's in all people, and it lies dormant due to ignorance. I found that extremely interesting. 
And I think it's really important for us to recognize that because the, the ignorance seems to be the cause of so many of the world's problems today. And I think that is true particularly in Christianity. Zen Buddhism acknowledges that, that education is kind of key for us moving forward into this state of enlightenment. So, once again this week, we see that the common ground for the great religions of the world are there. They simply need to be sought, understood, and acknowledged. And when it comes to what would Jesus say to Buddhism, I think he'd say thank you. I think he'd say that we may, while you may not call your way the way of Jesus, that is in fact what it is. The way of the Buddha, the way of peace and nonviolence, the way of kindness and honesty, the way of intellectual awareness and ethical conduct, they're all part of my way, Jesus would say. That's what my way is ultimately all about. I think he'd honor the Buddhist attempt to see beyond the materialism and hedonism that exists in so much of our world today. And I think he'd challenge the Buddhist the same way he'd challenge the Christian. Continue to think beyond yourselves. Daily resist the narcissism that is so prevalent. Think of others. Work to make this world a better place, not just for yourself, but for all of God's people. And yes, I think he'd say to love more, to love more deeply, to love more completely. Because regardless of the worldly distinctions that are placed upon us, in spite of the religious divisions that exist in the world today, we are all, every single one of us, God's child. So mindful of that, let me end this sermon the way my practice of group yoga ends. And that's with the word namaste. You know what the word namaste means? What does it mean, Barbara? I see the God light in you. It's translated in all kinds of different ways. The spirit of God that exists in me acknowledges and honors the spirit of God that exists in all of you. The spirit of God in each one of us. As we discover that, may we grow closer to him and may we always grow closer to one another. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, remind us that it's all about the way. where we hate what is evil, where we hold fast to what is good, where we outdo one another in showing honor. God, a way that rejoices in hope, that is patient in suffering, that perseveres in prayer, a way that extends hospitality to strangers, that rejoices with those who rejoice and that weeps with those who weep. God, the words of Romans, the way of Jesus, Lord, it's not all that different from the way of the Buddha. As we find common ground, may that deepen our own walk with you and allow us to walk more peaceably with those around us. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. At this time, would the ushers please come forward to receive our offering?
Before we leave, as always, let's spend some time in prayer together. Nadia Boltz Weber was one of the speakers in Georgia last week, and during the um, during the uh, one of her talks, she talked about prayer, and she said, you know, when communities come together in corporate prayer, people need to remember they're talking to God. We're talking to God. There, there certainly is a, is a purpose for us lifting up prayers together. It's kind of a way of us to converse with one another, to open up our lives to one another. But let's remember during these prayer times, we're not making announcements. We're talking, we're talking to God. So having said that, hopefully without intimidating you, um, what would you like to lift up in prayer today? We're glad you're here, and we're going to pray for your future, too, for where God is leading you next. Mike? Okay, Mike has a friend who was di- just diagnosed with ly- lymphoma from high school. We will remember him today. Mike? First name? We're going to remember Mike's sister, Libby, just had some surgery Anita? Okay, for Herb's uncle who fell and shattered his wrist. We will, what's his first name? Dick. Uncle Dick? Yes. We, we will remember him today. Wrist and, his wrist and his pelvis. Okay, we will remember. Yeah. A theater friend, Michael, who was diagnosed with cancer. We will remember him and his family during these tough days. Okay? Tuesday, for survivors of the Holocaust, we will remember those folks today. Okay, we're going to lift up a couple of our, Barbara's friends today and just ask that God would be present and near to them. Eleanor? That would be nice, yes. <laughs> speedy recovery would be great, yeah. Anything else? I'm sorry, Anita. National Capital Women, Presbyterian Women Prayer Breakfast next Saturday. We will remember that. The presbytery has just gone, undergone a major restructuring, and they're actually going to be hiring brand new staff, four new directors. So we want to pray for the larger church. One of the beauties of Presbyterianism is that we're connected. Um, there's a community beyond us, so we want to pray for the larger denomination in this area and for all the transition going on there. Anything else? Okay, who's going to lead us in prayer? Who's going to do that? Hazel, thank you.
Let's unite our hearts and minds now and pray that prayer that Jesus taught us and say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for our closing hymn. <laughs> Now, friends, to him who by his Spirit's work within each one of us is able to do abundantly more than anything we hope, dream, or even dare to imagine, to him be all glory and honor in our lives and in this church, now and forever. And all God's people agreed and said.